Those Evening Bells by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 4th of December 2016 Kent Those evening bells, those evening bells, How many a tale their music tells Of Yorkshire cakes and crumpets prime And letters only just in time The muffin boy has passed away the postman gone, and I must pay. For down below deaf Mary dwells, And does not hear those evening bells. And so twill be when she is gone, That tuneful peal will still ring on, And other maids with timely yells Forget to stay those evening bells. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Careless Nursemaid by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by John N. Daly I saw a maid sit on a bank, Beguiled by wooer, fain and fond, And whiles his flattering vows she drank, Her nurslings slipped within a pond. All even tide they talked and kissed, For she was fair, and he was kind. The sun went down before she wist Another sun had set behind. With angry hands and frowning brow That deemed her own the urchin's sin, She plucked him out, But he was now past being whipped for falling in. She then begins to wail the lad With shrikes that echo answered round, Oh, foolish maid, To be so sad the moment that her care was drowned. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Domestic Asides by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio Domestic Asides, or Truth in Parentheses I really take it very kind, this visit, Mrs. Skinner. I have not seen you such an age. The wretch has come to dinner. Your daughters, too, what loves of girls, what heads for painters' easels. Come here and kiss the infant, dears, and give it perhaps the measles. Your charming boys, I see, are home, from Reverend Mr. Russell's. Twas very kind to bring them both. What boots for my new Brussels? What little Clara left at home? Well, now I call that shabby. I should have loved to kiss her so. A flabby, dabby, babby. And Mr. S., I hope he's well. Ah, though he lives so handy, he never now drops in to sup. The better for our brandy. Come, take a seat. I long to hear about Matilda's marriage. You are come, of course, to spend the day. Thank heaven I hear the carriage. What, must you go? Next time I hope you'll give me longer measure. Nay, I shall see you down the stairs. With most uncommon pleasure. Good-bye, good-bye, remember all. Next time you'll take your dinners. Now, David, mind, I'm not at home in future to the Skinners. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Shooting Pains by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org By Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Shooting Pains the charge is prepared, Mac Heath. If I shoot any more, I'll be shot. For ill luck seems determined to star me. I have marched the whole day with a gun for no pay. Zounds, I better have been in the army. What matters Sir Christopher's leave? To his manner, I am sorry I came yet. With confidence fraught, my two pointers I brought, but we are not a point towards game yet. And that gamekeeper, too, 
with advice of my course he has been a nice chalker not far were his words i could go without birds if my legs could cry out they'd cry walker not hawker could find out a flaw my appointments are modern and mantoni and i've brought my own man to mark down all he can but i can't find a mark for my anthony the partridges where can they lie i have promised a leash to mrs jervis as the least i could do but without even two to brace me i am getting quite nervous to the peasants how well they're preserved my sport's not a jot more beholden as the birds are so shy for my friends i must buy and so send silver peasants and golden i have tried every form for a hair every patch every furze that could shroud her with toil unrelaxed till my patience is taxed but i cannot be taxed for hair powder i've been roaming for hours in three flats in the hope of a snipe for a snap at but still vainly i court the percussioning sport i find nothing for setting my cap at a woodcock this month is the time right and left i've made ready my lock for with well-loaded double but spite of my trouble neither barrel can i find a cock for a rabbit i should not despise but they lurk in their burrow so lowly this day is the eleventh it is not the seventh but they seem to be keeping it holy for a mallard i've voided the marsh and haunted each pool and each lake oh mine is not the luck to obtain thee o duck or to doom thee o drake like a draco for a field fair i fared far afield large or small i am never to sack bird not a thrush is so kind as to fly and i find i may whistle myself for a blackbird i am angry i am hungry i am dry disappointed and sullen and goaded and so weary and elf i am sick of myself and with number one seem overloaded as well one might beat round st paul's and look out for a cock or a hen there i have searched round and round all the baronet's ground but sir christopher hasn't a wren there joyce may talk of his excellent caps but for nightcaps they set me desiring and it's really too bad not a shot i have had with hall's powder renowned for quick firing if this is what people call sport oh of sporting i can't have a high sense and there still remains one more mischance on my gun fine for shooting without any license end of poem this recording is in the public domain john day a pathetic ballad by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by drew conway fifth of december two thousand and sixteen kent a day after the fair old proverb john day he was the biggest man of all the coachman kind with back too broad to be conceived by any narrow mind the very horses knew his weight when he was in the rear and wished his box a christmas box to come but once a year alas against the shafts of love what armour can avail soon cupid sent an arrow through his scarlet coat of mail the barmaid of the crown he loved from whom he never ranged for though he changed his horses there 
his love he never changed. He thought her fairest of all fairs, so fondly love prefers, and often among twelve outsides deemed no outside like hers. One day as she was sitting down beside the porter pump, he came and knelt with all his fat and made an offer plump. Said she, my taste will never learn to like so huge a man, so I must beg you will come here as little as you can. But still he stoutly urged his suit with vows and sighs and tears, yet could not pierce her heart although he drove the dart for years. In vain he wooed, in vain he sued, the maid was cold and proud, and sent him off to Coventry while on his way to Stroud. He fretted all the way to Stroud and thence all back to town. The course of love was never smooth, so he went up and down. At last her coldness made him pine to merely bones and skin, but still he loved like one resolved to love through thick and thin. O oh Mary, view my wasted back and see my dwindled calf. Though I have never had a wife, I've lost my better half. Alas, in vain he still assailed, her heart withstood the dint. Though he had carried sixteen stone, he could not move a flint. Worn out at last, he made a vow to break his being's link, for he was so reduced in size at nothing he could shrink. Now some we talk in water's praise and waste a deal of breath, but John, though he drank nothing else, he drank himself to death. The cruel maid that cursed his love found out the fatal close, for looking in the butt she saw the butt-end of his woes. Some say his spirit haunts the crown, but that is only talk, for after riding all his life his ghost objects to walk. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Huggins and Duggins by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Huggins and Duggins, Pastoral, After Pope Two swains are clowns, but call them swains, Whilst keeping flocks on Salisbury plains, For all that tend on sheep as drovers, are turned to songsters or to lovers. Each of the lass he'd called his dear began to carol loud and clear. First Huggins sang and Duggins then in the way of ancient shepherd men who thus alternate hitched in song all things by turns and nothing long. Huggins Of all the girls about our place there's one beats all in form and face. Search through all great and little Bumpstead. You'll only find one Peggy Plumstead. Duggins. To groves and streams I tell my flame. I make the cliffs repeat her name. When I'm inspired by gills and noggins, the rocks re-echo Sally Hoggins. Huggins. When I'm walking in the grove, I think of Peggy as I rove. I'd carve her name on every tree, but I don't know my ABC. Duggins. Whether I walk in hill or valley, I think of nothing else but Sally. I'd sing her praise, but I can sing. No song except God Save the King. Huggins. My Peggy does all nymphs excel and all confess she bears the bell. Where she goes, swains flock together, like sheep that follow the bell weather. Duggins. Sally is tall and not too straight. Those very poplar shapes I hate. 
but something twisted like an s a crook becomes a shepherdess huggins when peggy's dog her arms in prison i often wish my lot was hisen how often i should stand and turn to get a pat from hands like hern duggins i tell sal's lambs how blessed they be to stand about and stare at she but when i look she turns and shies and won't bear none but their sheep's eyes huggins love goes with peggy where she goes beneath her smile the garden grows potatoes spring and cabbage starts potatoes have eyes and cabbage hearts duggins where sally goes it's always spring her present brightens everything the sun smells bright but where her grin is makes brass farthings look like gin a's huggins for peggy i can have no joy she's sometimes kind and sometimes coy and keeps me by her wayward tricks as comfortless as sheep with ticks duggins sally is ripe as june or may and yet as cold as christmas day for when she's asked to change her lot lambs wool but sally she will not huggins only with peggy and with health i'll never wish for state or wealth talking of having health and more pence i'd drink her health if i had four pence duggins oh how that day would seem to shine if sally's bonds were red with mine she cries when such a wish i carry mary come up but will not marry end of poem this recording is in the public domain the china mender by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson good morning mr what you call well here's another pretty job lord help my lady what a smash if you had only heard her sob it was all through mr lambert but for certain he was whiny to think for to go to sit down on a table full of chiny deuce take your stupid head said my lady to his very face but politeness you know is nothing when there's chiny in the case and if ever a woman was fond of chiny to a passion it's my mistress and all sorts of it whether new or old-fashioned her brother's a sea captain and brings her home shiploads such bronzes and such dragons and nasty squatting things like toads and great nidnoddin mandarins with palsies in the head i declare i've often dreamt of them and had nightmares in my bed and a frightfuller they are lock she loves them all the better she'd have old nick himself made of chiny if they'd let her lock a mercy break her chiny and it's breaking her very heart if i touched it she would very soon say mary we must part to be sure she is unlucky only friday comes master randall and breaks a broken spout and fresh chips a teacup handle he's a dear sweet little child but he will so finger and touch and that's why my lady doesn't take to children much well there's stupid mr lambert with his two great coat flaps must go and sit down on the dresden shepherdess laps as if there was no such thing as rosewood chairs in the room i couldn't have made a greater sweep with the handle of a broom mercy on us how my mistress began to rave and tear well after all there's nothing like good ironstone wear for wear if i ever marry that's flat i'm sure it won't be john dockery i should be a wretched woman in a shop full of crockery i should never like to wipe it though i love to be neat and tidy and afraid of meat on market days every monday and friday i'm very much mistook if mr lambert's will be a catch the breaking the chiny will be the breaking off of his own match missus wouldn't have an angel if he was careless about chiny 
she never forgives a chip if it's ever so small and tiny lock i never saw a man in all my life in such a taking i could find it in my heart to pity him for all his mischief-making to see him standing a hammering and a stammering like a zany but what signifies apologies if they won't mend old cheney if he sent her up whole crates full from wedgwoods and mrs spode's he couldn't make amends for the cracked mandarins and smashed toads well every one has their tastes but for my part my own self i'd rather have the figures on my poor dear grandmother's old shelf a nice pea-green pole parrot and two reapers with brown ears of corn and a shepherd with a crook after a lamb with two gilt horns and such a jimmy jessamy in top boots and sky-blue vest and a frill and flowered waistcoat with a fine bow-pot at the breast god help her poor old soul i shall come into em at her death though she's a hearty woman for her years except her shortness of breath well you may think the things I will mend if they won't lord mend us all my lady will go in fits and mr lambert won't need to call i'll be bound in any money if i had a guinea to give he won't sit down again on chiny the longest day he has to live poor soul i only hope it won't forbid his bands of marriage or he'd better have sat behind on the spikes of my lady's carriage but you'll join em all of course and stand poor mr lambert's friend i'll look in twice a day just to see like how they mend to be sure it is a sight that might draw tears from dogs and cats here's this pretty little pagoda now has lost four of its cocked hats be particular with the pagoda and then here's this pretty bowl the chinese prince is making love to nothing because of this hole and here's another chinese man with a face just like a doll do stick his pigtail on again and just mend his parasol but i needn't tell you what to do only do it out of hand and charge whatever you like to charge my lady won't make a stand well good morning mr what do you call for it's time our gossip ended and you know the proverb the less is said the sooner the chinese mended end of poem this recording is in the public domain Domestic Didactics by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org, by Jason in Panama. Domestic Didactics by an Old Servant 1. The Broken Dish What's life but full of care and doubt with all its fine humanities? With parasols we walk about, long pigtails and such vanities. We plant pomegranate trees and things, and go in gardens sporting with toys and fans of peacock's wings to painted ladies courting we gather flowers of every hue and fish in boats for fishes build summer houses painted blue but life's as frail as dishes walking about their groves of trees blue bridges and blue rivers how little thought them two chinese they'd both be smashed to shivers Two ode to peace written on the night of my mistress's grand rout o oh, peace o oh, come with me and dwell but stop for there's the bell o oh, peace for thee i go and sit in churches on wednesday when there's very few in loft or pew another ring the tarts are come from birches o oh, peace for thee i have avoided marriage hush there's a carriage o oh, peace thou art the best of earthly goods the five miss woods o oh, peace thou art the goddess i adore there comes some more o oh, peace thou child of solitude and quiet that's lord dunn's footman for he loves a riot o oh, peace knocks will not cease o oh, peace thou wert for human comfort planned that's Wipart's band. O oh, peace, how glad I welcome thy approaches. I hear the sound of coaches. 
O oh, peace, O oh, peace, another carriage stops. It's early for the Blenkinsops. O oh, peace, with thee I love to wander. But wait till I have showed up Lady Squander, and now I've seen her up the stair. O oh, peace, but here comes Captain Hare. O oh, peace, thou art the slumber of the mind, untroubled, calm and quiet, and unbroken. If that is Alderman Guzzle from Portsukin, Alderman Gobble won't be far behind. O oh, peace, serene in worldly shyness, make way there for his serene highness. O oh, peace, if you do not disdain to dwell amongst the menial train, I have a silent place and lone that you and I may call our own. Where tumult never makes an entry. Susan, what business have you in my pantry? O oh, peace, but there is Major Monk at variance with his wife. O oh, peace, and that great German Vander Trunk, and that great talker Miss Apreece. O oh, peace, so dear to poet's quills. O oh, peace, our greatest renovator. I wonder where I put my waiter. O oh, peace, but here my odal cease. I have no peace to write of peace. Three, a few lines on completing forty-seven. When I reflect with serious sense, while years and years run on, how soon I may be summoned hence, there's Cook a calling, John. Our lives are built so frail and poor, on sand and not on rocks. We're hourly standing at death's door. There's someone double knocks. All human days have settled terms. Our fates we cannot force. This flesh of mine will feed the worms. They're come to lunch, of course. And when my body's turned to clay, and dear friends hear my knell, oh, let them give a sigh and say, I hear the upstairs bell. 4. To Mary Housemaid on Valentine's Day Mary, you know I've no love nonsense, and though I pen on such a day, I don't mean flirting on my conscience, or writing in the courting way. Though beauty hasn't formed your feature, it saves you perhaps from being vain, and many a poor unhappy creature may wish that she was half as plain. Your virtues would not rise an inch, although your shape was two foot taller and wisely you let others pinch great waists and feet to make them smaller. You never try to spare your hands from getting read by household duty, but doing all that it commands, their coarseness is a moral beauty. Let Susan flourish her fair arms, and at your old legs sneer and scoff, but let her laugh, for you have charms that nobody knows nothing of. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lament for the Decline of Chivalry by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Well hast thou cried, departed Burke. All chivalrous romantic work is ended now and past. That iron age, which some have thought of metal rather overwrought, is now all overcast. Ay, where are those heroic knights of old, those armadillo whites who wore plated vest? Great Charlemagne and all his peers are cold, enjoying with their spears an everlasting rest. And bold King Arthur sleepeth sound, so sleep his knights who gave that round old table such a cot. O oh, time has plucked the plumy brow, and none engage it at tourneys now, but those that go to law. Grim John O'Gaunt is quite gone by, and Guy is nothing but a Guy. Orlando lies forlorn. Bold Sidney and his kidney, nay, those early champions, what are they but knights without a morn? No Percy branch now perseveres, like those of old in breaking spears. The name is now a lie. Surgeons alone, by any chance, are all that ever couch a lance, to couch a body's eye. Alas for lion-hearted Dick, that cut the Moslems to the quick, his weapon lies in peace, 
Oh, it would warm them in a trice if they could only have a spice of his old mace in Greece. The famed Rinaldo lies a cold, and Tancred too, and Godfrey bold, that scaled the holy wall. Though Saracen meets Paladin, we fear no great Saladin, but only grow the small. O Cressus, too, have dwindled since, to penny things at our black prince. Historic pens would scoff, the only one we moderns had was nothing but a sandwich lad, and measles took him off. Where are those old and feudal clans, their pikes and bills and partisans, their hauberks, jerkins, buffs? A battle was a battle then, a breathing piece of work, but men fight now with powder puffs. A kirtle axe is out of date, the good old crossbow bends to fate. Tis gone, the archer's craft. No tough arm bends the spinning yew, and jolly draymen ride in lieu of death upon the shaft. The spear, the gallant tilter's pride, the rusty spear is laid aside. O oh, spits, now domineer, the coat of mail is left alone, and where is all chain armor gone? Go ask at Brighton Pier. We fight in ropes and not in lists, bestowing handcuffs with our fists, and lo, the vulgar art. No mounted man is overthrown, a tilt, it is a thing unknown, except upon a cart. Methinks I see the bounding barb, clad like his chief in steely garb, for warding still suppliance. Methinks I hear the trumpet stir, tis but the guard to Exeter that bugles the defiance. And cavils, when will cavaliers set ringing helmets by the ears and scatter plumes about, or blood if they are in the vein? That tap will never run again. Alas, the cask is out. No iron crackling now is scored by dint of battle axe or sword to find a vital place. Though certain doctors will pretend a while before they kill a friend to labor through his case. Farewell, then, ancient men of might, Crusader, errant squire, and knight, Our coats and customs soften, To rise would only make you weep. Sleep on, in rusty iron sleep, As in a safety coffin. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Playing at Soldiers by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Who'll serve the king? What little urchin is there never had that early scarlet fever of marital trappings caught? Trappings well called, because they trap and catch full many a country chap to go where fields are fought. What little urchin with a rag hath never made a little flag, or plate will show the manner, and wooed each tiny neighbor still, Tommy or Harry, Dick or Will? to come beneath the banner. Just like that ancient shape of mist in Hamlet crying, List, O oh, list! Come, who will serve the king, and strike frog-eating Frenchmen dead, and cut off bony party's head, and all that sort of thing. So used I, when I was a boy, to march with military toy, and ape the soldier's life, and with a whistle or a hum I thought myself a duke or drum, at least, or earl of fife, with gun of tin and sword of lath, Lord, how I walked in glory's path with regimental mates, by sound of trump and rub a dubs to siege a wash house, charge the tubs, or storm the garden gates. Ah, me, my retrospective soul, as over memories must a roll, I cast my eyes in you, my former comrades all the while rise up before me rank and file, and form in din review. Ay, there they stand and dress in line, Lubbock and Fenn and David Vine, And dark Jamaki Ford, And Limpy Wood and Cocky Hawes, Our captain always made, Because he had a real sword, Long Lawrence, Natty Smart, and Soam, Who said he had a gun at home. But that was all a brag, Ned Ryder, too, that used to sham A prancing horse, and big Sam Lamb, that would hold up the flag. Tom Anderson and Dunny White, who never write about it right, for he was deaf and dumb. Jack Pike, Jim Crack, and Sandy Gray, 
and dicky bird that wouldn't play unless he had the drum and peter holt and charlie jepp a chap that never kept the step no more did surly hugh bob harrington and fighting jim we often had to halt for him to let him tie his shoe quarrelsome scott and martin dick that killed the bantam cock to stick the plumes within his hat bill hook and little tommy grout that got so thumped for calling out eyes right to squinting matt dan simpson that with peter dodd was always in the awkward squad and those two greedy blakes that took our money to the fair to buy the corps a trumpet there and laid it out in cakes where are they now an open war with open mouth declaring for or fallen in bloody fray compelled to tell the truth i am their fights all ended with the sham their soldiership in play brave Soam sends cheeses out in trucks and martin sells the cock he plucks and jepp now deals in wine harrington bears a lawyer's bag and warlike lamb retains his flag but on a tavern sign they tell me cocky haw's sword is seen upon a broker's board and as for fighting jim in bishopsgate last witten's tide his unresisting cheek i spied beneath a quaker brim quarrelsome scott is in the church for rider now your eye must search the marts of silk and lace birds drums are filled with figs and mute and i i've got a substitute to soldier in my place in the poem this recording is in the public domain mary's ghost a pathetic ballad by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by drew conway eleventh of december two thousand and sixteen kent twas in the middle of the night to sleep young william tried when mary's ghost came stealing in and stood at his bedside o oh, william dear o oh, william dear my rest eternal ceases alas my everlasting peace is broken into pieces i thought the last of all my cares would end with my last minute but though i went to my long home i didn't stay long in it the body snatchers they have come and made a snatch at me it's very hard them kind of men won't let a body be you thought that i was buried deep quite decent like and cherry but from her grave in mary bone they've come and boned your mary the arm that used to take your arm is took by dr vice and both my legs are gone to walk the hospital at guy's i vowed that you should have my hand but fate gives us denial you find it there at dr bell's in spirits and a vial as for my feet the little feet you used to call so pretty there's one i know in bedford row that others in the city i can't tell where my head is gone but dr carp you can as for my trunk it's all packed up to go by pickford's van i wish you'd go to mr p and save me such a ride i don't half like the outside place they've took for my inside the cock it crows i must be gone my william we must part but i'll be yours in death although sir astley has my heart don't go to weep upon my grave and think that there are be they haven't left an atom there of my anatomy end of poem this recording is in the public domain the widow by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by larry wilson one widow at a grave will sob a little while and weep and sigh if two should meet on such a job they'll have a gossip by and by if three should come together why three widows are good company if four should meet by any chance four is a number very nice to have a rubber in a trice but five will up and have a dance poor mrs c why should i not declare her name her name was cross was one of those the common lot had left to weep no common loss for she had lately buried then a man the very best of men a lingering truth discovered first 
whenever men are at the worst to take the measure of her woe it was some dozen inches deep i mean in crape and hung so low it hid the drops she did not weep in fact what human life appears it was a perfect veil of tears though ever since she lost her prop and stay alas he wouldn't stay she had never a tear to mop except one little angry drop from passion's eye as moore would say because when mr cross took flight it looked so very like a spite he died upon a washing day still widow cross went twice a week as if to wet a widow's cheek and soothe his grave with sorrow's gravy twas nothing but a make-believe she might as well have hoped to grieve enough of brine to float a navy and yet she often seemed to raise a cambric kerchief to her eye a duster ought to be the phrase its work was all so very dry the springs were locked that ought to flow in england or in widow woman as those that watch the weather know such backward springs are not uncommon but why did widow cross take pains to call upon the dear remains remains that could not tell a jot whether she ever wept or not or how his relict took her losses oh my black ink turns red for shame but still the naughty world must learn there was a little german came to shed a tear in anna's urn at the next grave to mrs cross's for there an angel's virtue slept too soon did heaven assert its claim but still her painted face he kept encompassed in an angel frame he looked quite sad and quite deprived his head was nothing but a hat-band he looked so lone and so unwived that soon the widow cross contrived to fall in love with even that band and all at once the brackish juices came gushing out through sorrow's sluices tear after tear too fast to wipe though sopped and sopped and sopped again no leak in sorrow's private pipe but like a bursting on the main whoe'er has watched the window-pane i mean to say in showery weather has seen two little drops of rain like lovers very fond and fain at one another creeping creeping till both at last embrace each other so fared it with that couple's weeping the principle was quite as active tear unto tear kept drawing near their very blacks became attractive to cut a shorty story shorter conceive them sitting tete a tete two cups hot muffins on a plate with honest urn to hold hot water the brazen vessel for a while had lectured in an easy song like abernethy on the bile the scalded herb was getting strong all seemed as smooth as smooth could be to have a cosy cup of tea alas how often human sippers with unexpected bitters meet and buds the sweetest of the sweet like sugar only meet the nippers the widow cross i should have told had seen three husbands to the mould she never sought an indian pyre like hindu wives that lose their loves but with a proper sense of fire put up instead with three removes thus when with any tender words or tears she spoke about her loss the dear departed mrs cross came in for nothing but his thirds for as all widows love too well she liked upon the list to dwell and oft ripped up the old disasters she might indeed have been supposed a great ship owner for she prosed eternally of her three masters thus foolish woman while she nursed her mild sauchong she talked and reckoned what had been left her by her first and by her last and by her second alas not all her annual rents could then entice the little german not mr cross's three per cents our consuls ever make him her man he liked her cash he liked her houses but not that dismal bit of land she always settled on her spouses so taking up his hat and ban said he you'll think my conduct odd but here my hopes no more may linger i thought you had a wedding finger but oh it's a curtain rod
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Open Question by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson It is the King's Highway that we are in, and in this way it is that thou hast placed the lions. Bunyan What? Shut the gardens, lock the lattice gate, Refuse the shilling and the fellow's ticket, And hang a wooden notice up to state, On Sundays no admittance at this wicket. The birds, the beasts, and all the reptile race Denied to friends and visitors till Monday. Now, really, this appears the common case Of putting too much Sabbath into Sunday. But what is your opinion, Mrs. Grundy? The garden, so unlike the ones we dub of tea, Wherein the artisan carouses, Mere shrubberies without one drop of shrub, Wherefore should they be closed like public houses? No ale is vended at the wild deer's head, nor rum, nor gin, not even of a Monday. The line is not carved, or gilt, or red, and does not send out porter of a Sunday. But what is your opinion, Mrs. Grundy? The bear denied, the leopard under locks, as if his spots would give contagious fevers, the beaver close as hat within its box, so different from other Sunday beavers. The birds invisible, the gnawway rats, the seal hermetically sealed till Monday, the monkey tribe, the family of cats. We visit other families on Sunday, but what is your opinion, Mrs. Grundy? What is the brute profanity that shocks the supersensitively serious feeling? The kangaroo, is he not orthodox to bend his legs the way he does in kneeling? But strict Sir Andrew in his Sabbath coat struck all a heap to see Quatamundi, or did the Kentish plum tree faint to note the pelicans presenting bills on Sunday? But what is your opinion, Mrs. Grundy? What feature has repulsed the serious set? What error in the bestial birth or breeding to put their tender fancies on the fret? One thing is plain: it is not in the feeding. Some stiffish people think that smoking joints are carnal sins twixt Saturday and Monday. But then the beasts are pious on these points, for they all eat cold dinners on Sunday. But what is your opinion, Mrs. Grundy? What change comes o'er the spirit of the place, as if transmuted by some spell organic, turns fell hyena of the ghoulish race? The snake pro tempore, the true satanic, do Irish minds, whose theory allows that now and then Good Friday falls on Monday, do Irish minds suppose that Indian cows are wicked bulls of Bashan on the Sunday? But what is your opinion, Mrs. Grundy? There are some moody fellows, not a few, who, turned by nature with a gloomy bias, renounce black devils to adopt the blue, and think that when they are dismal they are pious. Is it possible that Pug's untimely fun has sent the brutes to Coventry till Monday? Or perhaps some animal, no serious one, was overheard in laughter on Sunday? But what is your opinion, Mrs. Grundy? What dire offense have serious fellows found to raise their spleen against the regent's spinny? Were charitable boxes handed round, and would not guinea pigs subscribe their guinea? Perchance the damoiselle refused to mould the feathers in her head, at least till Monday. Or did the elephant unseemly bolt a tract presented to be read on Sunday? But what is your opinion, Mrs. Grundy? At whom did Leo struggle to get loose? Who mourns through monkey tricks his damaged clothing? Who has been hissed by the Canadian goose? On whom did the llama spit in utter loathing? Some Smithfield saint did jealous feelings tell to keep the puma out of sight till Monday, because they prayed extempore as well as certain wild itinerants on Sunday. But what is your opinion, Mrs. Grundy? To me it seems that in the oddest way, begging the pardon of each rigid socius, our would-be keepers of the Sabbath day are like the keepers of the brute ferocious, as soon the tiger might expect to stalk about the grounds from Saturday till Monday, 
as any harmless man to take a walk if saints could clap him in a cage on sunday but what is your opinion mrs grundy in spite of all hypocrisy can spin as surely as i am a christian scion i cannot think it is a mortal sin unless he's loose to look upon a lion i really think that one may go perchance to see a bear as guiltless as on monday that is provided that he did not dance ruins no worse than bacon on a sunday but what is your opinion mrs grundy in spite of all the fanatic compiles i cannot think the day a bit diviner because no children with forestalling smiles throng happy to the gates of eden minor it is not plain to my poor faith at least that what we christen natural on monday the wondrous history of bird and beast can be unnatural because it's sunday but what is your opinion mrs grundy whereon is sinful fantasy to work the dove the winged columbus of man's haven the tender love-bird or the filial stork the punctual crane the providential raven the pelican whose bosom feeds her young nay we must cut from saturday till monday that feathered marvel with a human tongue because she does not preach upon a sunday but what is your opinion mrs grundy the busy beaver the sagacious beast the sheep that owned an oriental shepherd that desert ship the camel of the east the horned rhinoceros the spotted leopard the creatures of the great creator's hand are surely sights for better days than monday the elephant although he wears no band he has no sermon in his trunk for sunday but what is your opinion mrs grundy what harm if men who burn the midnight oil weary of frame and worn and wan in feature seek once a week their spirits to a soil and snatch a glimpse of animated nature better it were if in his best of suits the artisan who goes to work on monday should spend a leisure hour among the brutes than make a beast of his own self on sunday but what is your opinion mrs grundy why zounds what raised so protestant a fuss omit the zounds for which i make apology but that the papists like some fellows thus had somehow mixed up dens with their theology is brahma's bowl a hindu god at home a papal bowl to be tied up till monday or leo like his namesake pope of rome that there is such dread of them on sunday but what is your opinion mrs grundy spirit of kant have we not had enough to make religion sad and sour and snubbish but saints zoological must cant their stuff as vessels cant their ballast rattling rubbish once let the sect triumphant to their text shut nero up from saturday till monday and sure as fate they will deny us next to see the dandelions on a sunday but what is your opinion mrs grundy in the poem this recording is in the public domain a black job by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by larry wilson no doubt the pleasure is as great of being cheated as to cheat ubidris the history of humankind to trace since eve the first of dupes our doom unriddled a certain portion of the human race has certainly a taste for being diddled witness the famous mississippi dreams a rage that time seems only to redouble the banks joint stocks and all the flimsy schemes for rolling in pactolian streams that cost our modern rogues so little trouble no matter what to pasture cows on stubble to twist sea sand into a solid rope to make french bricks and fancy bread of rubble or light with gas the whole celestial cope only proposed to blow a bubble and lord what hundreds will subscribe for soap soap it reminds me of a little tale though not a pig's the hawbuck's glory when rustic games and merriment prevail but here's my story once on a time no matter when a knot of very charitable men set up a philanthropical society 
professing on a certain plan to benefit the race of man and in particular that dark variety which some suppose inferior as in vermin the sable is to ermine as smut to flower as coal to alabaster as crows to swan as soot to driven snow as blacking or as ink to milk below or yet a better smile to show a ragman's dolls to images in plaster however as is usual in our city they had a sort of managing committee a board of grave responsible directors a secretary good at pen and ink a treasurer of course to keep the chink and quite an army of collectors not merely male but female duns young old and middle-aged of all degrees with many of those persevering ones who might by might would beg a cheese and what might be their aim to rescue afric's sable sons from fetters to save their bodies from the burning shame of branding with hot letters their shoulders from the cowhide's bloody strokes their necks from iron yokes to end or mitigate the ills of slavery the planter's avarice the driver's knavery to school the heathen negroes and enlighten them to polish up and brighten them and make them worthy of eternal bliss why no the simple end and aim was this reading a well-known proverb much amiss to wash and whiten them they looked so ugly in their sable hides so dark so dingy like a grubby lot of sooty sweeps or colliers besides however the poor elves might wash themselves nobody knew if they were clean or not on nature's fairness they were quite a blot not to forget more serious complaints that even while they joined in pious hymn so black they were and grim in face and limb they looked like devils though they sang like saints the thing was undeniable they wanted washing not that slight ablution to which the skin of the white man is liable merely removing transient pollution but good hard honest energetic rubbing and scrubbing sousing each sooty frame from heels to head with stiff strong saponaceous lather and pails of water hot each rather but not so boiling as to turn em red so spoke the philanthropic man who laid and hatched to nurse the plan and oh to view its glorious consummation the brooms and mops the tubs and slops the baths and brushes in full operation to see each crow or jim or john go in a raven and come out a swan while well, fair as cavendishes veins and rustles black venus rises from the soapy surge and all the little niggerlings emerge as lily white as mussels sweet was the vision but alas however in prospectus bright and sunny to bring such visionary scenes to pass one thing was requisite and that was money money that pays the laundress and her bills for socks and collars shirts and frills cravats and kerchiefs money without which the negroes must remain as dark as pitch a thing to make all christians sad and shivery to think of millions of immortal souls dwelling in bodies black as coals and living so to speak in satan's livery money the root of all evil dross and stuff but oh how happy ought the rich to feel whose means enable them to give enough to blanch an african from head to heel how blessed yea thrice blessed to subscribe enough to scour a tribe while he whose fortune was at best a brittle one although he gave but pence how sweet to know he helped to bleach a hottentot's great toe or little one moved by this logic or appalled to persons of a certain turn so proper the money came when called in silver gold and copper presents from friends to blacks or foes to whites trifles and offerings and widow's mites plump legacies and yearly benefactions with other gifts and charitable lifts printed in lists and quarterly transactions and thus elisha brettel an iron kettle the dowager lady scannel a piece of flannel rebecca pope a bar of soap the missus howls half a dozen towels the master rushes two scrubbing brushes mr t groom a stable broom 
and Mrs. Grubb a tub. Great were the sums collected, and great results in consequence expected. But somehow, in the teeth of all endeavor, according to reports at yearly courts, the blacks confound them, were as black as ever. Yes, in spite of all the water soused aloft, soap plain and mottled, hard and soft, soda and pure lash, huckabuck and sand, brooms, brushes, palm of hand, the scours in the office strong and clever, in spite of all the tubbing, rubbing, scrubbing, the routing and the grubbing, the blacks, confound them, were as black as ever. In fact, in his perennial speech, the chairman owned the niggers did not bleach as he had hoped. From being washed and soaked, a circumstance he named with grief and pity, but still he had the happiness to say for self and the committee, by preserving the present way and scrubbing at the blacks from day to day, although he could not promise perfect white, from certain symptoms that had come to light, he hoped in time to get them gray. Lulled by this vague assurance, the friends and patrons of the sable tribe continued to subscribe, and waited, waited on with much endurance. Many a frugal sister, a thrifty daughter, many a stinted widow, pinching mother, with income by the tax made somewhat shorter, still paid implicitly her crown per quarter, only to hear as every year came round that Mr. Treasure had spent her pound and as she loved her sable brother, that Mr. Treasure must have another. But spite of pounds or guineas, instead of giving any hint of turning to neutral tent, the plaguy negroes and their pickaninnies were still the color of the bird that caws, only some very aged souls showing a little gray upon their paws, like daws. However, nothing clashed by such repeated failures, or abashed the court still met. The chairman and directors, the secretary good at pen and ink, the worthy treasurer who kept the chink, and all the cash collectors, with hundreds of that class, so kindly credulous, without whose help no charlatan alive or bubble company could hope to thrive, or busy chevalier, however sedulous, those good and easy innocents, in fact, who willingly receive chaff for corn, as pointed out by butler's tact still find a secret pleasure in the act of being plucked and shorn. However, in long hundreds there they were, thronging the hot and close and dusty court, to hear once more addresses from the chair, and regular report. Alas, concluding in the usual strain, that what with everlasting wear and tear and scrubbing brushes hadn't got a hair, the brooms, mere stumps, would never serve again. The soap was gone, the flannels all in shreds, the towels worn to threads, the tubs and pails too shattered to be mended, and what was added with a deal of pain, but as accounts correctly would explain, though thirty thousand pounds had been expended, the blackamoors had still been washed in vain. In fact, the negroes were as black as ink, yet still as the committee dared to think, and hoped the proposition was not rash, a rather free expenditure of cash. But ere the prospect could be made more sunny, up jumped a little lemon-colored man, and with an eager stammer thus began, in angry earnest, though it sounded funny, What? Uh, more subscriptions? No, 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 not I. You have had time, time, time enough to try. They won't come white. Then why, 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 more money? Why, said the chairman with an accent bland, the gentle waving of his dexter hand, why must we have more dross and dirt and dust, more filthy lucre in a world, more gold? The why, sir, very easily is told, because humanity declares we must. We've scrubbed the negroes till we've nearly killed them, and finding that we cannot wash them white, but still their gratitude offends the sight. We mean to gild them. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Etching Moralized To a Noble Lady By Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org By Larry Wilson To point a moral 
johnson fairest lady and noble for once on a time condescended to accept in the humblest of rhyme and a style more of gay than milton a few opportune verses designed to impart some didactical hints in a needlework art not described by the countess of wilton an art not unknown to the delicate hand of the fairest and first in this insular land but in patronage royal delighting and which now your own feminine fantasy wins though it scarce seems a ladylike work that begins in a scratching and ends in a biting yet oh the dames of the scandalous school would but use the same acid and sharp pointed tool that are plied in the said operations oh would that our candours on copper would sketch for the first of all things in beginning to etch are good grounds for our representations those protective and delicate coatings of wax which are meant to resist the corrosive attacks that would ruin the copper completely thin ceramids which whoso remembers the bee so applauded by watts the divine l l d will be careful to spread very neatly for why like some intricate deed of the law should the ground in the process be left with a flaw aqua fortis is far from a joker and attacking the part that no coating protects will turn out as distressing to all your effects as a landlord who puts in a broker then carefully spread the conservative stuff until all the bright metal is covered enough to repel a destructive so active for in etching as well as in morals pray note that a little raw spot or a hole in a coat your ascetics find vastly attractive thus the ground being laid very even and flat and then smoked with a taper till black as a hat still from future disasters to screen it just allow me by way of precaution to state you must hinder the footman from changing your plate nor yet suffer the butler to clean it nay the housemaid perchance in her passion to scrub may suppose the dull metal in want of a rub like the shield which swift's readers remember not to mention the chance of some other mishaps such as having your copper made up into caps to be worn on the first of september but aloof from all damage by betty or john you secure the veiled surface and trace thereupon the design you conceive the most proper yet gently and not with a needle too keen let us pierce to the wax through the paper between and of course play old scratch with the copper so in worldly affairs the sharp practising man is not always the one who succeeds in his plan witness shylock's judicial exposure who as keen as his knife yet with agony found that while urging his point he was losing his ground and incurring a fatal disclosure but perhaps without tracing at all you may choose to indulge in some little extempore views like the older artistical people for example corydon playing his pipe in a low country marsh with a cow after kite and a goat skipping over a steeple a wild deer at a rivulet taking a sup with a couple of pillars put in to fill up like the columns of certain diurnals or a very brisk sea in a very stiff gale and a very dutch boat and a very big sail or a bevy of wretch infernals architectural study or rich arabesque allegorical dream or a view picturesque near to naples or venice or florence or as harmless as lambs and as gentle as doves a sweet family cluster of plump little loves like the children by reynolds or lawrence but whatever the subject your exquisite taste will ensure a design very charming and chaste like yourself full of nature and beauty yet besides the good points you already reveal you will need a few others of well-tempered steel and especially formed for the duty for suppose that the tool be imperfectly set over many weak links in your line you will fret like a pupil of waltham and cotton who remains by the brink of the water agape while the jack trout or barbell effects its escape through the gut or silk line being rotten therefore let the steel point be set truly and round that the finest of strokes may be even and sound flowing glibly where fancy would lead em but alas for the needle that fetters the hand 
and forbids even sketches of liberty's land to be drawn with the requisite freedom oh the botches i've seen by a tool of the sort rather hitching than etching and making in short such stiff crabbed and angular scratches that the figures seem statues or mummies from tombs while the trees were as rigid as bundles of broom and the herbage like bunches of matches the stiff clouds as if carefully ironed and starched while a cast iron bridge meant for wooden or arched something more like a road than a river prithee who in such characteristics could see any trace of the beautiful land of the free the free mason free trader free liver but prepared by a hand that is skilful and nice the fine point glides along like a skate on the ice at the will of the gentle designer who impelling the needle just presses so much that each line of her labor the copper may touch as if done by a penny a liner and behold how the fast-growing images gleam like the sparkles of gold in a sunshiny stream till perplexed by the glittering issue you repine for a light of a tenderer kind and in choosing a substance for making a blind do not sneeze at the paper called tissue for subdued by the sheet so transparent and white your design will appear in a soberer light and reveal its defects on inspection just as glory achieved or political scheme and some more of our dazzling performances seem not so bright on a cooler reflection so the juvenile poet with ecstasy views his first verses and dreams that the songs of his muse are as brilliant as moors and as tender till some critical sheet scans the faulty design and alas takes the shine out of every line that had formed such a vision of splendor certain objects however may come in your sketch which designed by hand unaccustomed to etch with a luckless result may be branded wherefore add this particular rule to your code let all vehicles take the wrong side of the road and man woman and child be left-handed yet regard not the awkward appearance with doubt but remember how often mere blessings fall out that at first seem no better than curses so till things take a turn live and hope and depend that whatever is wrong will come out right in the end and console you for all your reverses but of errors why speak when for beauty and truth your free spirited etching is worthy in sooth of that club may all honour betide it which though dealing in copper by genius and taste has accomplished a service of plate not disgraced by the work of a goldsmith beside it so your sketch superficially drawn on the plate it becomes you to fix in a permanent state which involves a precise operation with a keen biting fluid which eating its way as in other professions is common they say has attained an artistical station and it's oh that some splenetic folks i could name if they must deal in acids would use but the same in such innocent graphical labors in the place of the virulent spirit wherewith like the polecat the weasel and things of that kith they keep biting the backs of their neighbors but beforehand the wax or the shoemaker's pitch you must build a neat dike round the margin in which you may pour the dilute aqua fortis for if law like a dream it will shock you to trace your design with horrible froth on its face like a wretch in articulo mortis like a wretch in the pangs that too many endure for the use of strong waters without any pure a vile practice most sad and improper for from painful examples this warning is found that the raw burning spirit will take up the ground in the churchyard as well as on copper but the acid has duly been lowered and bites only just where the visible metal invites like a nature inclined to meet troubles and behold as each slender and glittering line effervesces you trace the completed design in an elegant beadwork of bubbles and yet constantly secretly eating its way the shrewd acid is making the substance its prey like some sorrow beyond inquisition which is gnawing the heart and the brain all the while that the face is illumined by its cheerfulest smile and the wit is in bright ebullition but still stealthily feeding the treacherous stuff 
has corroded and deepened some portions enough the pure sky and the water so placid and these tenderer tints to defend from attack with some turpentine varnish and sooty lamp-black you must stop out the ferritine acid but before with the varnishing brush you proceed let the plate with cold water be thoroughly freed from other less innocent liquor after which on whatever you want to protect put a coat that will act to that very effect like the black one which hangs on the vicar then the varnish well dried urge the biting again but how long at its metal the old foot may remain time and practice alone can determine but of course not so long that the mountain and mill and rude bridge and the figures whatever you will are as black as the spots on your ermine it is true none the less that a dark-looking scrap with a sort of black teeth and black force mayhap is considered as rather rembrandty and that very black cattle and very black sheep a black dog and a shepherd as black as a sweep are the pets of some great dilettante so with certain designers one needs not to name all this life is a dark scene of sorrow and shame from our birth to our final adjourning yea this excellent earth and its glories alack what with ravens palls cottons and devils as black as a warehouse for family mourning but before your own picture rise at that pitch while the lights are still light and the shadows though rich more transparent than ebony shutters never minding what black-arted critics may say stop the biting and pour the green fluid away as you please into bottles or gutters then removing the ground and the wax at the heat cleanse the surface with oil spermaceti or sweet for your hand a performance scarce proper so some careful professional person secure for the laundress will not be a safe amateur to assist you in cleaning the copper and in truth tis a rather unpleasantish job to be done on a hot german stove or a hob though as sure of an instant forgetting when as after the dark clearing off of a storm the fair landscape shines out in a lustre as warm as the glow of the sun in its setting thus your etching complete it remains but to hint that with certain assistance from paper and print which the proper mechanic will settle you may charm your friends without any sad tale of such perils and ills as beset lady sale with a fine india proof of your metal in the poem this recording is in the public domain A Tale of a Trumpet, Part One, by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. A Tale of a Trumpet. Old woman, old woman, will you go a shearing? Speak a little louder, for I'm very hard hearing. Old Ballad. Of all old women hard of hearing, the deafest sure was Dame Eleanor Spearing. On her head, it is true, two flaps there grew that served for a pair of gold rings to go through but for any purpose of ears in a parley they heard no more than ears of barley no hint was needed from d e f you saw in her face that the woman was deaf from her twisted mouth to her eyes so peery each queer feature asked a query a look that said in a silent way who and what and how and eh i'd give my ears to know what you say and well she might for each auricular was deaf as a post and that post in particular that stands at the corner of doyot street now and never hears a word of wow ears that might serve her now and then as extempore racks for an idle pen or to hang with hoops from jewellers shops with coral ruby or garnet drops or provided the owner so inclined ears to stick a blister behind but as for hearing wisdom or wit falsehood or folly or tell-tale tit or politics whether of fox or pit sermon lecture or musical bit harp piano fiddle or kit they might as well for any such wish have been buttered done brown and laid in a dish she was deaf as a post as said before and as deaf as twenty similes more 
including the adder, that deafest of snakes, which never hears the coil it makes. She was deaf as a house, which modern tricks of language would call deaf as bricks. For her all humankind were dumb. Her drum, indeed, was so muffled a drum that none could get a sound to come, unless the devil who had two sticks. She was deaf as a stone. Say, one of the stones Demosthenes sucked to improve his tones. And surely deafness could no further reach than to be in his mouth without hearing his speech. She was deaf as a nut, for nuts, no doubt, are deaf to the grub that's hollowing out, as deaf, alas, as the dead and forgotten. Gray has noticed the waste of breath in addressing the dull, cold ear of death, or the felon's ear that was stuffed with cotton, or Charles I in statue quo, or the stillborn figures of Madame Tussaud with their eyes of glass and their hair of flax that only stare whatever you ax for their ears you know are nothing but wax she was deaf as the ducks that swam in the pond and wouldn't listen to mrs bond as deaf as any frenchman appears when he puts his shoulders into his ears and whatever the citizen tells his son as deaf as gog and magog at one or still to be a simile seeker as deaf as dog's ears to einfield's speaker she was deaf as any tradesman's dummy or as pharaoh's mother's mother's mummy whose organs for fear of our modern sceptics were plugged with gums and antiseptics she was deaf as a nail that you cannot hammer a meaning into for all your clamour there never was such a deaf old gammer so formed to worry both lindley and murray by having no ear for music or grammar deaf to sounds as a ship out of soundings deaf to verbs and all their compoundings adjective noun and adverb and particle deaf to even the definite article no verbal message was worth a pin though you hired an earwig to carry it in in short she was twice as deaf as deaf burke or all the deafness in yearsley's work who in spite of his skill in hardness of hearing boring blasting and pioneering to give the dunny organ a clearing could never have cured dame eleanor spearing of course the loss was a great privation for one of her sex whatever her station and none of the less that the dame had a turn for making all families one concern and learning whatever there was to learn in the prattling tattling village of tringham as who wore silk and who wore gingham and what the atkins shop might bring em how the smiths contrived to live and whether the fourteen murphys all pigged together the wages per week of the weavers and skinners and what they boiled for their sunday dinners what plates the bugsbys had on the shelf crockery china wooden or delf and if the parlour of mrs o'grady had a wicked french print or death in the lady did snip and his wife continue to jangle had mrs wilkinson sold her mangle what liquor was drunk by jones and brown and the weekly score they ran up at the crown if the cobbler could read and believed in the pope and how the grubs were off for soap if the snobs had furnished their room upstairs and how they managed for tables and chairs beds and other household affairs iron wooden or staffordshire wares and if they could muster a whole pair of bellows in fact she had much of the spirit that lies perdue in a notable set of paul pry's by courtesy called statistical fellows a prying spying inquisitive clan who have gone upon much of the self-same plan jotting the labouring classes riches and after poking in pot and pan and routing garments in want of stitches having ascertained that a working man wears a pair and a quarter of average breeches but this alas from her loss of hearing was all a sealed book to dame eleanor spearing and often her tears would rise to their founts supposing a little scandal at play twixt mrs o'fie and mrs Anne fay that she couldn't audit the gossips accounts tis true to her cottage they still came and ate her muffins just the same and drank the tea of the widowed dame and never swallowed a thimble the less of something the reader is left to guess for all the deafness of mrs s who saw them talk and chuckle and cough but to see and not share in the social flow she might as well have lived you know in one of the houses in owen's row 
near the new river head with its water cut off and yet the almond oil she had tried and fifty infallible things beside hot and cold and thick and thin dabbed and dribbled and squirted in but all remedies failed and though some it was clear like the brandy and salt we now exalt had made a noise in the public ear she was just as deaf as ever poor dear at last one very fine day in june suppose her sitting busily knitting and humming she didn't quite know what tune for nothing she heard but a sort of a whiz which unless the sound of the circulation or of thoughts in the process of fabrication by a spinning genius operation it's hard to say what buzzing it is however except that ghost of a sound she sat in a silence most profound the cat was purring about on the mat but her mistress heard no more of that than if it had been a boatswain's cat and as for the clock the moments nicking the dame only gave it credit for ticking the bark of her dog she did not catch nor yet the click of lifted latch nor yet the creak of the opening door nor yet the fall of a foot on the floor but she saw the shadow that crept on her gown and turned to the skirt of a darker brown and lo a man a peddler i marry with the little black shop that such tradesmen carry stocked with brooches ribbons and rings spectacles razors and other odd things for lad and lass as autolycus sings a chapman for goodness and cheapness of wear he held fair dealer enough at a fair but deemed a piratical sort of invader by him we dub the regular trader who luring the passengers in as they pass by lamps gay panels and mouldings of brass and windows with only one huge pane of glass and his name in gilt characters german or roman if he isn't a peddler at least he's a showman however in the stranger came and the moment he met the eyes of the dame threw her as knowing a nod as though he had known her fifty long years ago and presto before she could utter jack much less robinson he opened his pack and then from amongst his portable gear with even more than a peddler's tact slick himself might have envied the act before she had time to be deaf in fact popped a trumpet into her ear there ma'am try it you needn't buy it the latest new patent and nothing comes nigh it for affording the deaf at a little expense the sense of hearing and hearing of sense a real blessing and no mistake invented for poor humanity's sake for what can be a greater privation than playing dummy to all creation and only looking at conversation great philosophers talking like plato's and members of parliament moral as cato's and your ears as dull as waxy potatoes not to name the mischievous quizzers sharp as knives but double as scissors who get you to answer quite by guess yes for no and no for yes yes that's very true says dame eleanor s try it again no harm in trying i'm sure you'll find it worth your buying a little practice that is all and you'll hear a whisper however small through an act of parliament party wall every syllable clear as day and even what people are going to say i wouldn't tell a lie i wouldn't but my trumpets have heard what solomon's couldn't and as for scott he promises fine but can he warrant his horns like mine never to hear what a lay shouldn't only a guinea and can't take less that's very dear says dame eleanor s dear oh dear to call it dear why it isn't a horn you buy but an ear only think you'll find on reflection you're bargaining ma'am for the voice of affection for the language of wisdom and virtue and truth and the sweet little innocent prattle of youth not to mention the striking of clocks cackle of hens crowing of cocks lowing of cow and bull and ox bleating of pretty pastoral flocks murmur of waterfowl over the rocks every sound that echo mocks vocals fiddles and musical box and zounds to call such a concert dear but i mustn't swear with my horn in your ear why in buying that trumpet you'll buy all those that harper or any trumpeter blows at the queen's levies or the lord mayor's shows at least as far as the music goes 
including the wonderful lively sound of the guards keg bugles all the year round come suppose we call it a pound come said the talkative man of the pack before i put my box on my back for this elegant useful conductor of sound come suppose we call it a pound only a pound it's only the price of hearing a concert once or twice it's only the fee you might give mr c and after all not hear his advice but common prudence would bid you stump it for not to enlarge it's the regular charge at a fancy fair for a penny trumpet lord what's a pound to the blessing of hearing a pound's a pound said dame eleanor spearing try it again no harm in trying a pound's a pound there's no denying but think what thousands and thousands of pounds we pay for nothing but hearing sounds sounds of equity justice and law parliamentary jabber and jaw pious cant and moral saw hocus pocus and nong tong paw and empty sounds not worth a straw why it costs a guinea as i'm a sinner to hear the sounds at a public dinner one pound one thrown into the puddle to listen to fiddle faddle and fuddle not to forget the sounds we buy from those who sell their sounds so high that unless the managers pitch it strong to get a signora to warble a song you must fork out the blunt with a haymaker's prong it's not the thing for me i know it to crack my own trumpet up and blow it but it's the very best and time will show it there was mrs f so very deaf that she might have worn a percussion cap and be knocked on the head without hearing it snap well i sold her a horn and the very next day she heard from her husband at botany bay come eighteen shillings that's very low you'll save the money as shillings go and i never knew so bad a lot by hearing whether they ring or not eighteen shillings it's worth the price supposing you're delicate minded and nice to have the medical man of your choice instead of the one with the strongest voice who comes and asks you how's your liver and where you ache and whether you shiver and as to your nerves so apt to quiver as if he was hailing a boat in the river and then with a shout like pat in a riot tells you to keep yourself perfectly quiet or a tradesman comes as tradesmen will short and crusty about his bill of patience indeed a perfect scorner and because you're deaf and unable to pay shouts whatever he has to say in a vulgar voice that goes over the way down the street and round the corner come speak your mind it's no or yes i've half a mind said dame eleanor s try it again no harm in trying of course you hear me as easy as lying no pain at all like a surgical trick to make you squall and struggle and kick like juno or rose whose ear undergoes such horrid tugs at membrane and gristle for being as deaf as you to a whistle you may go to surgical chaps if you choose who will blow up your tubes like copper flues or cut your tonsils right away as you'd shell out your almonds for christmas day and after all a matter of doubt whether you ever would hear the shout of the little blackguards that bawl about there you go with your tonsils out why i knew a deaf welshman who came from glamorgan on purpose to try a surgical spell and paid a guinea and might as well have called a monkey into his organ for the aurist only took a mug and poured in his ear some acoustical drug that instead of curing deafened him rather as hamlet's uncle served hamlet's father that's the way with your surgical gentry and happy your luck if you don't get stuck through your liver and lights at a royal entry because you never answered the sentry try it again dear madam try it many would sell their beds to buy it i warrant you often wake up in the night ready to shake to a jelly with fright and up you must get to strike a light and down you go in you know what whether the weather is chilly or hot that's the way a cold has got to see if you heard a noise or not why bless you a woman with organs like yours is hardly safe to step out of doors just fancy a horse that comes full pelt but as quiet as if he was shod with felt till he rushes against you with all his force and then i needn't describe the course while he kicks you about with remorse 
how awkward it is to be groomed by a horse or a bullock comes as mad as king lear and you never dream that the brute is near till he pokes his horn right in your ear whether you like the thing or lump it and all for want of buying a trumpet i'm not a female to fret and vex but if i belonged to the sensitive sex exposed to all sorts of indelicate sounds i wouldn't be deaf for a thousand pounds lord only thinking of chucking a copper to jack or bob with a timber limb who looks as if he was singing a hymn instead of a song that's very improper or just suppose in a public place you see a great fellow a pulling a face while staring his eyes in his mouth like an o and how is a poor deaf lady to know the lower orders are up to such games if he's calling green peas or calling her names they're ten pence a peck said the deafest of dames tis strange what very strong advising by word of mouth or advertising by chalking on walls or placarding on vans with fifty other different plans in very high pressure in fact of pressing it needs to persuade one to purchase a blessing whether the soothing american syrup a safety hat or a safety stirrup infallible pills for the human frame or roland's odonto an ominous name a dowdney's suit which the shape so hits that it beats all others into fits a mechie's razor for beards unshorn or a ghost of a whisper catching horn try it again ma'am only try was still the voluble peddler's cry it's a great privation there's no dispute to live like the dumb unsociable brute and to hear no more of the pro and con and how society's going on than mumbo jumbo or prester john and all for want of this sin qua non whereas with a horn that never offends you may join the genteelest party that is and enjoy all the scandal the gossip and quiz and be certain to hear of your absent friends not that elegant ladies in fact in genteel society ever detract or lend a brush when a friend is blacked at least as a mere malicious act but only talk scandal for fear some fool should think they were bred at charity school or maybe you like a little flirtation which even the most don juanish rake would surely object to undertake at the same high pitch as an altercation it's not for me of course to judge how much a deaf lady ought to begrudge but half a guinea seems no great matter letting alone more rational patter only to hear a parrot chatter not to mention that feathered wit the starling who speaks when his tongue is slit the pies and jays that utter words and other dicky gossips of birds that talk with as much good sense and decorum as many beaks who belong to the quorum try it buy it say ten and six the lowest price a miser could fix don't pretend with horns of mine like some in the advertising line to magnify sounds on such marvellous scales that the sounds of a cod seem as big as a whale's but popular rumours right or wrong charity sermons short or long lecture speech concerto or song all noises and voices feeble or strong from the hum of a gnat to the clash of a gong this tube will deliver distinct and clear or supposing by chance you wish to dance why it's putting a hornpipe into your ear try it buy it buy it try it the latest new patent and nothing comes nigh it for guiding sounds to their proper tunnel only try till the end of june and if you and the trumpet are out of tune i'll turn it gratis into a funnel in short the peddler so beset her lord bacon couldn't have gammoned her better with flatteries plump and indirect and plied his tongue with such effect a tongue that could almost have buttered a crumpet the deaf old woman bought the trumpet end of part one this recording is in the public domain a tale of a trumpet part two by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by jason in panama the peddler was gone with the horn's assistance she heard his steps die away in the distance and then she heard the tick of the clock the purring of puss and the snoring of shock and she purposely dropped a pin that was little and heard it fall as plain as a skittle 
'Twas a wonderful horn to be but just, Nor meant to gather dust, must, and rust. So in half a jiffy, or less than that, In her scarlet cloak and her steeple hat, Like old Dame Trot, but without her cat, The gossip was hunting all Tringham thorough, As if she meant to canvas the borough, Trumpet in hand, or up to the cavity, and sure had the horn been one of those the wild rhinoceros wears on his nose it couldn't have ripped up more depravity depravity mercy shield her ears twas plain enough that her village peers in the ways of vice were no raw beginners for whenever she raised the tube to her drum such sounds were transmitted as only come from the very brass band of human sinners ribald jest and blasphemous curse bunyan never vented worse with all those weeds not flowers of speech which the seven dialecticians teach filthy conjunctions and dissolute nouns and particles picked from the kennels of towns with irregular verbs for irregular jobs chiefly active in rows and mobs picking possessive pronouns fobs and interjections as bad as a blight or an eastern blast to the blood and the sight fanciful phrases for crime and sin and smacking of vulgar lips where gin garlic tobacco and offals go in a jargon so truly adapted in fact to each thievish obscene and ferocious act so fit for the brute with the human shape savage baboon or libidinous ape from their ugly mouths it will certainly come should they ever get wary of shamming dumb alas for the voice of virtue and truth and the sweet little innocent prattle of youth the smallest urchin whose tongue could tang shocked the dame with a volley of slang fit for fagin's juvenile gang while the charity chap with his muffin cap his crimson coat and his badge so garish playing at dumps or pitch in the hole cursed his eyes limbs body and soul as if they didn't belong to the parish twas awful to hear as she went along the wicked words of the popular song or supposing she listened as gossips will at a door ajar or a window agape to catch the sounds they allowed to escape those sounds belonged to depravity still the dark illusion or bolder brag of the dexterous dodge and the lots of swag the plundered house or the stolen nag the blazing rick or the darker crime that quenched the spark before its time the wanton speech of the wife immoral the noise of drunken or deadly quarrel with savage menace which threatened the life till the heart seemed merely a strop for the knife the human liver no better than that which is sliced and thrown to an old woman's cat and the head so useful for shaking and nodding to be punched into holes like a shocking bad hat that is only fit to be punched into wadding in short wherever she turned the horn to the highly bred or the lowly born the working man who'd looked over the hedge or the mother nursing her infant pledge the sober Quaker averse to quarrels, or the governess pacing the village through, with her twelve young ladies, two and two, looking, as such young ladies do, trussed by decorum and stuffed with morals, whether she listened to hob or bob, knob or snob, the squire on his cob, or trudge and his ass at a tinkering job, to the saint who expounded at little Zion, or the sinner who kept the golden lion, the man teetotally weaned from liquor, the beadle, the clerk, or the reverend vicar, nay, the very pie in its cage of wicker, she gathered such meanings, double or single, that like the bell with muffins to sell, her ear was kept in a constant tingle. But this was not to the tales of shame, the constant runnings of evil fame, foul and dirty and black as ink, that her ancient cronies with nod and wink poured in her horn like slops in a sink while sitting in conclave as gossips do with their hyson or howqua black or green and not a little of feline spleen lapped up in catty packages too to give a zest of the sipping and supping for still by some invisible tether 
scandal and tea are linked together as surely as scarification and cupping yet never since scandal drank bohea or slow or whatever it happened to be for some grocerly thieves turned over new leaves without much amending their lives or their tea no never since cup was filled or stirred were such wild and horrible anecdotes heard as blackened their neighbours of either gender especially that which is called the tender but instead of the softness we fancy therewith was hardened in vice as the vice of a smith women the wretches had soiled and marred whatever to womanly nature belongs for the marriage tie they had no regard nay sped their mates to the sexton's yard like madame lafarge who with poisonous pinches kept cutting off her l by inches and as for drinking they drank so hard that they drank their flat irons pokers and tongs the men they fought and gambled at fairs and poached and didn't respect gray hairs stole linen money plate poultry and courses and broke in houses as well as horses unfolded folds to kill their own mutton and would their own mothers and wives for a button but not to repeat the deeds they did backsliding in spite of all moral skid if all were true that fell from the tongue there was not a villager old or young but deserved to be whipped imprisoned or hung or sent on those travels which nobody hurries to publish at colburn's or longman's or murray's meanwhile the trumpet con amore transmitted each vile diabolical story and gave the least whisper of slips and falls as that gallery does in the dome of st paul's which as all the world knows by practice or print is famous for making the most of a hint not a murmur of shame or buzz of blame not a flying report that flew at a name not a plausible gloss or significant note not a word in the scandalous circles afloat of a beam in the eye or diminutive moat but vortex like that tube of tin sucked the censorious particle in and truth to tell for as willing an organ as ever listened to serpents hiss nor took the viperous sounds amiss on the snaky head of an ancient gorgon the dame it is true would mutter shocking and give her head a sorrowful rocking and make a clucking with palate and tongue like the call of partlet to gather her young a sound when human that always proclaims at least a thousand pities and shames but still the darker the tale of sin like certain folks when calamities burst who find a comfort in hearing the worst the farther she poked the trumpet in nay worse whatever she heard she spread east and west and north and south like the ball which according to captain z went in at his ear and came out at his mouth what wonder between the horn and the dame such mischief was made wherever they came that the parish of tringham was all in a flame for although it required such loud discharges such peals of thunder as rumbled at lear to turn the smallest of table beer a little whisper breathed into the ear will sour a temper as sour as varges in fact such very ill blood there grew from this private circulation of stories that the nearest neighbours the village through looked at each other as yellow and blue as any electioneering crew wearing the colour of wigs and tories ah well the poet said in sooth that whispering tongues can poison truth yea like a dose of oxalic acid wretch and convulse poor peace the placid and rack dear love with internal fuel like arsenic pastry or what is as cruel sugar of lead that sweetens gruel at least such torments began to ring em from the very morn when that mischievous horn caught the whisper of tongues in tringham the social clubs dissolved in huffs and the sons of harmony came to cuffs while feuds arose and family quarrels that discomposed the mechanics of morals for screws were loose between brother and brother while sisters fastened their nails on each other such wrangles and jangles and miff and tiff and spar and jar and breezes as stiff as ever upset a friendship or skiff 
the plighted lovers who used to walk refused to meet and declined to talk and wished for two moons to reflect the sun that they mightn't look together on one while wedded affection ran so low that the oldest john anderson snubbed his joe and instead of the toddle adown the hill hand in hand as the song has planned scratched her penniless out of his will in short to describe what came to pass in a true though somewhat theatrical way instead of love in a village alas the piece they performed was the devil to pay however as secrets are brought to light and mischievous comes home like chickens at night and rivers are tracked throughout their course and forgeries traced to their proper source and the sow that ought by the ears is caught and the sin to the sinful door is brought and the cat at last escapes from the bag and the saddle is placed on the proper nag and the fog blows off and the key is found and the faulty scent is picked out by the hound and the fact turns up like a worm from the ground and the matter gets wind to waft it about and a hint goes abroad and the murder is out and the riddle is guessed and the puzzle is known so the truth was sniffed and the trumpet was blown tis a day in november a day of fog but the tringham people are all agog fathers mothers and mothers sons with sticks and staves and swords and guns as if in pursuit of a rabid dog but their voices raised to the highest pitch declare that the game is a witch a witch over the green and along by the george past the stocks and the church and the forge and round the pound and skirting the pond till they come to the whitewashed cottage beyond and there at the door they muster and cluster and thump and kick and bellow and bluster enough to put old nick in a fluster a noise indeed so loud and long and mixed with expressions so very strong that supposing according to popular fame wise woman and witch to be the same no hag with a broom would unwisely stop but up and away through the chimney top whereas the moment they burst the door planted fast on her sanded floor with her trumpet up to her organ of hearing lo and behold dame eleanor spearing oh then arises the fearful shout bawled and screamed and bandied about seize her drag the old jezebel out while the beadle the foremost of all the band snatches the horn from her trembling hand and after a pause of doubt and fear puts it up to his sharpest ear now silence silence one and all for the clerk is quoting from holy paul but before he rehearses a couple of verses the beadle lets the trumpet fall for instead of the words so pious and humble he hears a supernatural grumble enough enough and more than enough twenty impatient hands and rough by arm and leg and neck and scruff apron kerchief gown of stuff cap and pinner sleeve and cuff are clutching the witch wherever they can with the spite of woman and fury of man and then but first they kill her cat and murder her dog on the very mat and crush the infernal trumpet flat and then they hurry her through the door she never never will enter more away away down the dusty lane they pull her and haul her with might and main and happy the hawbuck tom or harry dandy or sandy jerry or larry who happens to get a leg to carry and happy the foot that can give her a kick and happy the hand that can find a brick and happy the fingers that hold a stick knife to cut or pin to prick and happy the boy who can lend her a lick nay happy the urchin charity bred who can shy very nigh to her wicked old head alas to think how people's creeds are contradicted by people's deeds but though the wishes that witches utter can play the most diabolical rings send styes in the eye and measle the pigs grease horses heels and spoil the butter smut and mildew the corn on the stalk and turn new milk to water and chalk blight apples and give the chickens the pip 
and cramp the stomach and cripple the hip and waste the body and addle the eggs and give a baby bandy legs though in common belief a witch's curse involves all these horrible things and worse as ignorant bumpkins all profess no bumpkin makes a poke the less at the back or ribs of old eleanor s as if she were only a sack of barley or gives her credit for greater might than the powers of darkness confer at night on that other old woman the parish charlie ay now's the time for a witch to call on her imps and sucklings one and all news piewacket or peck in the crown as matthew hopkins has handed them down dick and willet and sugar and sack greedy grizzle jarmara the black vinegar tom and the rest of the pack ay now's the nick for her old friend harry to come with his tail like the bold glengarry and drive her foes from their savage job as a mad black bullock would scatter a mob but no such matter is down in the bond and spite of her cries that never cease but scare the ducks and astonish the geese the dame is dragged to the fatal pond and now they come to the water's brim and in they bundle her sink or swim though it's twenty to one that the wretch must drown with twenty sticks to hold her down including the help to the self-same end which a travelling peddler stops to lend a peddler yes the same the same who sold the horn to the drowning dame and now is foremost amid the stir with a token only revealed to her a token that makes her shudder and shriek and point with her finger and strive to speak but before she can utter the name of the devil her head is under the water level moral there are folks about town to name no names who much resemble that deafest of dames and over their tea and muffins and crumpets circulate many a scandalous word and whisper tales they could only have heard through some such diabolical trumpets end of poem this recording is in the public domain